term uh, three. Often term three is our most uh, active uh, period of events. Uh, and this week we have um, uh, three events. We have uh, today's one, and then tomorrow we have two uh, in-person uh, events uh, with a speaker, Christina Kironska, who's going to talk about Myanmar, Taiwan relations, and also the struggle for uh, an asylum law in, uh, in Taiwan. Now, many of the events that we organize at the SOA Center of Taiwan Studies are designed to link in to things that we cover in our uh, teaching program. I think today is a really good example uh, of this, with today's focus on uh, LGBT families in Taiwan. Over the last, I would say, uh, five or six years, we've seen really growing st uh, um, student interest in uh, gender topics on Taiwan. So that was one of the uh, motivations for inviting uh, Rita Jung to um, uh, to give today's uh, talk. So we're really delighted today to welcome uh, Dr. Rita Jung to discuss her work that comes out of her award-winning uh, PhD uh, dissertation. Um, uh, Rita graduate, got her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in communication studies and currently is a uh, assistant professor in the global health program at National uh, Taiwan uh, University. Like many of the speakers we'd love to invite um, uh, to SOAS, she's someone who, who somehow manages to combine um, her academic life with uh, social uh, activism. And, um, and sometimes when I'm kind of uh, um, looking at Rita, I just, just um, in awe of the way that she manages to kind of combine so many different uh, projects together with being a, um, uh, a well-respected academic. So, for example, uh, she's in in recent years she's been one of the key organizers of the North American Taiwan Studies uh, Association, one of the key players in the Taiwan Studies field over the last um, uh, three decades, and an organization that had a huge influence uh, on myself and my own um, uh, research. And currently, she's the uh, the president of the North American Taiwan Studies uh, Association. But she's also been involved in election and party politics in Taiwan. In 2020, she was a, um, a legislative candidate uh, for the Green Party Taiwan. And between 2020 and 2021, she was the party's secretary uh, general following the uh, election. And that's one of the reasons why she features in uh, Taiwan's Green Parties, um, particularly chapters 14 and 15. And, um, and subsequently, she worked with me um, on the Chinese version um, of, the, uh, of the book. Another one of her areas of social activism, um, and, and more closely related to, um, to today's talk, is that she's had over a decade of experience uh, as a volunteer at uh, Taiwan Tongzhi Hotline, uh, one of the key LGBT rights um, associations that we've heard a lot about. Uh, both in um, talks uh, and also activist um, uh, talks. And if that wasn't enough, she's um, also been involved in Taiwan's media. Um, she's a host of one of the Ghost Island Media uh, podcasts. We've heard about Ghost Island Media from uh, Emily Wu in last year's uh, summer school. Um, her podcast, uh, Z Green Party, um, is a really interesting one that really focuses on gender issues in Taiwanese society, being nominated for the best new podcast in the 2020 KK Box uh, Awards. So we're really delighted to welcome someone who has such an amazing um, kind of profile, both academically and in terms of um, social activism. Um, so let me now hand over to um, Rita to hear about your award winning uh, research. Thanks for. For coming to to so and hopefully next time we can bring you here in person yeah i hope that too uh thank you dr uh dr fell for such an amazing introduction you, you make me sound like a wonderful you know you know experienced person uh and i really need that a confidence boost everything has been very difficult lately um so let me yeah let me first 
share my uh so i think now you can you can see my slides can you see my slides now okay thank you very much yeah so my topic today is scaffolding family conflict reconciliation model from taiwan Tongzhi, uh which roughly translates to lgbtq plus not entirely equivalent so the for the rest of the of the talk i will use Tongzhi instead of lgbtq uh and their parents um and like dr fell said um, I, yeah, I got my PhD from uh, UT Austin. Feels like a long time ago. So just a little bit more about myself and I'll do it counter chronologically, just some highlights of what I've been doing. Uh, like right now I am a project assistant professor in College of Public Health, National Taiwan University, which is actually not a field that was, I have ever been trained in. So it's actually quite an in interesting transition for me and people been asking, what are you doing in public health? When I was in communication studies, people were like, what is communication studies? When I was an applied linguist, people were like, what is applied linguistics? And now in public health, people are like, what is public health? Um, so, you know, just everywhere you have to explain what you're doing. Basically, I am teaching classes and doing research about health inequality, public health advocacy, and health communication. In some other courses like academic writing, oral presentation, critical thinking, in qualitative research methods. So these are classes I teach and also related to the research that I'm doing now. And uh, meanwhile, I also teach at a different university, Yangming Jiao Tong University as uh, an action at assistant professor in Institute of Communication Studies. So over there, I teach interpersonal communication, feminism and gender studies. And, uh, Oh, and I am the president of North American Taiwan Studies Association. For those of you who study in the UK, you probably have heard of EAST, the East, the European Association of Taiwan Studies. So uh, in uh, North American Taiwan Studies Association, abbreviated as NATA. So NATA and EAST are two, uh, you know, uh, organizations that work a lot together. And this year, our NATA conference is going to take place in July 8th to 10th in Washington, D.C. with the theme of Taiwan studies and application. And part of the reason is uh, myself and uh, the key people in on the team now are really, uh, we have experiences with, you know, the applied, the practical side of academic research. And we think it would be a very wonderful time to start talking about how, you know, academia, you know, people in academia could go across the border and then could apply to other fields. And before that, uh, yes, ever since I got back from the uh, from the U U.S., so I graduated in the end of August 2019, and then I flew back to Taiwan, had one night of sleep, I woke up the next morning, and then I just started campaigning uh, for the legislative union. And um, so I was the failed candidate, tried to run, way too difficult couldn't make it work uh, for details please read dr fell's book he has documented all the failures of taiwan of green party taiwan mostly because of the you know the political system is uh really make it very difficult for small parties to survive and uh, after we lose the election i stay to be the secretary general that means to run the party um to make sure you know to plan for uh, the upcoming election, which is happening in this November, so you have to think about. So the uh, legislative union election is a national level one. So every four years we have national level, and in between every four years we also have local elections. So now local elections coming. When I was the secretary general, I have to think about okay, who's going to run in what district, and then if this district show you know high support for Green Party Taiwan, but we don't have a candidate now, then I have to go and search for a potential candidate. That's mostly what I did, and I also get to be the uh, Taiwan representative. They call it Taiwan counselor in Global Greens and Asian Pacific Greens because Green Party is an international party. There are more than 100 Green parties in the world. So uh, fun thing. And then uh, so from year 2013 to 2019 when, was when I was doing my PhD in University of Texas, Austin in communication studies. And before that, I really cannot remember when I started, but I know 
it start I started when I was really young uh, as a volunteer in Taiwan Tongzhi Hawa Association. And th this is a place where I spend most of my time. Even for my dissertation, a lot of the data that comes from my involvement with the with the uh, the association. This association was established in 1998, and it is the biggest LGBTQ organizations in not just Taiwan but also in Asia. So it you know it does a lot of important work, not just for this group of people in Taiwan but also you know in uh, Korea, Japan, and a lot of other countries. They will come to Taiwan and kind of you know collaborate with with Hotline because Hotline does have a lot of experiences. And it was also during my time uh, in Taiwan Tongzhi Hotline Association, I quickly picked up a thing, like very important thing that people always talked about, right? I started when I was just like in my early 20s. And um, um, so like, you know, so I went to the events and I volunteered. I just, I was there all the time. And very quickly, I started to realize that people are always talking about coming out. And coming out is so important, right? You have to come out. And then when I'm talking about coming out, how to come out, have you come out? Did you come out to that person? Oh, and, oh, I came out and blah, blah, blah. So it became a very, very common subject that people talked about. But before I dive into the, you know, the conversation that I had with people that I met in Hotline, I wanted to ask you know, the audience here, how would you define coming out? What is coming out? Feel free to just turn on your mic and uh, shout the answers or type in the chat. I think I can access the chat. Oh, maybe I can't. Never mind. So, how would you define coming out? Oh, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Fell for help. How would you define it's coming out to parents? Or coming, coming out, out to friends? friends? Yeah, so when you hear the term, what is the first thing that pops up in your head? Uh, okay, so B is uh, on chat said accepting who you are. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, for me, my first thought was about um, um, the kind of the, telling the parents or telling friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've got another. Very good, great. We've got another one coming out in, in chat yeah. as well. Can you see the okay. chat? No, I cannot see the chat. So um, you probably have. Yeah, help me with that. Okay. Hello, yeah. Rita. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, yes. David. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's probably um three parts to this, mm -hmm. but I think that um the first part of coming out is actually um, an acceptance of yourself, mm -hmm. almost coming out to yourself and, and accepting that you are um, homosexual or gay or, or le a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And then um, secondly, to your immediate close circle, which could be your, mm -hmm. your family and your close friends, and then to a wider community, maybe your work mm -hmm. colleagues and things like that. So that that's what it would mean to me, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the answers now we have touched on very important development of the theory of, of coming out of four or five decades. So when I started as an activist in this movement, uh, I am now in my late 30s. So the theories about coming out, actually, you know, the official theory that first came out was in the 1960s, and then mostly in the 1970s and the 80s, and it started to see some some uh, different trend in the theorizing of coming out. So I'm going to start by how I experienced coming out, and then we'll go to a little bit of the theoretical background of coming out. So. Uh, Probably because I have been in this social movement, the discourse of coming out a lot of time is about that the personal is political. So you have to come out. Coming out is so important, right? If you're an activist, you have to be out there. You have to show people um, 
you know, who you are, because the more people that come out, we're going to sway the society. We're going to, you know, change the policy and stuff like that. And then, yeah, and that's how, that's how I picked up this message that it's that I have to come out. And even to this day, uh, this is the earlier quote from 992, all lesbian and gay men must come out of the closet if any of us is to be free. So coming out is not just about yourself, right? You have to do it for the rest of the community, however you define it. And then or in 2016, uh, Manning said, those who do not come out might be labeled as self, self-hating, immature, secretive, and foolish. So that is the message that I grew up with, is that you have to come out. Just You just have to. And especially difficult, actually, uh, earlier that we said, right, you have to first accept yourself and maybe come out to your close circle and then come out to a wider uh, community. But our experiences was actually kind of reverse. It was actually easier to come out to people who, you know, for the lack of a better term, doesn't ma- don't matter that much. Right, so you may, maybe you could come out to your friends, maybe your colleagues, maybe people online, but coming out to family is actually the most difficult for Taiwanese Tongzi. So coming out to family, it quickly became my focus of my academic work and also my uh, activist work, partly because uh, I also had trouble with my family. So I thought, you know, I would spend most of my time here and see if I can figure out how to deal with this problem while I also do my research. So coming out to family has been um, one of the most difficult things for a Tongzi to do, especially in Taiwan. Uh, it is difficult across a, a lot of different cultures, but in Taiwan it is indeed very difficult. And coming out to family has mostly been identified as something like what well, I told them. And that means it's a discrete event of disclosure. And the evidence comes from as early as 1982 and go all the way to 2021. And there are many, many more. So all of these research defined coming out as disclosure. So coming out and disclosure have been used almost interchangeably. Right? Sometimes some of these research, they didn't even define or conceptualize or operationalize coming out. They simply use coming out and disclosure as if they, these are the two, these are the same things. And just These are just some, there are just really, really a lot of research about coming out that operationalize coming out as disclosure. And uh, this research could be grouped into uh, sort of four category with the center idea is that coming out is disclosure. So there are a lot of research on the predictors of disclosure, right? In what condition, like under what circumstances, or what kind of people, in what kind of country, what kind of culture, family are more likely to come out. And then there are research that study the actual content of disclosure. So that event where people sit down and tell their significant uh, people in their life, mostly their family, about their uh, tongzi or uh, non-heterosexual identity. So the content of disclosure is another thing. And the third thing is a parent's immediate reaction to that disclosure that had happened. And then there is another uh, big group of research that focuses on the implication of disclosure. So the health implication, um, the relational implication, even the social implication of disclosure. So all of these, so these are four main areas of study about coming out, which is defined as disclosure. So you can really see that there is a coming out imperative. It becomes almost like a moral, uh, like, you know, it's it's like a moral imperative. You just have to do it, right? Like Manning said, if you don't do it, people may think that you are self-hating and secretive and immature and stuff like that. But, you know, for all the time that I devoted into this movement with people who are more likely to come out, even though sometimes not to their family, but, you know, they're willing to go on the street, go out on the street and talk to strangers, maybe online about their um, non-heterosexual identity. 
But I also have a lot of friends who are not involved in these movements who cannot come out, don't want to come out, meaning they don't want to disclose, don't want to come out, they don't, they just don't seem necessary or just for any kind of reason, they don't do that. So my first research uh, when I was in uh, UT Austin, right? This is my first year as a PhD student. I always said, okay. And before I, st I started my PhD in communication studies, I was a literature major in applied linguistics. I actually have never done communication studies with research. Uh, so even to this day, I have no idea how I got in UT. I have no idea how I got out, but I had my degree. So I'm just gonna take it around with it. So in early 2014, uh, I was thinking about my research topic. And then I started to think about all of my friends, right, who are not, who are not coming out, who decide not to, or still don't know how to, or for any kind of reason. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna talk to them because all these people still have to live, right? Even though we have this coming out imperative, but these people, they, they still have to carry on their lives without following the imperative. And particularly, I'm interested in their family relationship. So I focus on people who are of my age at the time, about uh, like late 20s, like early 30s, because this was the time when your parents would start to ask you about, are you gonna get married? Are you gonna have kids? So I thought, okay, I wanna see how these people, while maintaining their closeted status, maintain their family relationship when they deal with these difficult topics, like difficult conversation. And so how do they, how do they uh, attend to both goals? What kind of communicative strategies do they use to do that? So that was my interest. So uh, I put out, I first of all went through IRB. I don't know whether in UK you have to do that, but just IRB. So you have to prove to the people that this is a good research, you're not gonna hurt people and blah, blah, blah. So I got my IRB and then I put out the recruitment message that, oh, I wanna talk to people who are in this age range and who have not come out to their parents and at least one of the parents does not know of your non-heterosexual identity. Uh, so I ended up talking to about 30 people. But then when I started to interview my participants, I started to realize one thing that was very confusing to me, which is that actually most of my participants had already disclosed to their to their parents or they know for sure that their parents actually know of their Tongzi identity. Either they know that their parents saw their diary, you know, their web browsing history or stuff like that, and they have fights about it. And um, you know, and then I was like, wait, I thought I wanted to talk to people who have not come out. But then most of you have already dis disclosed. I was, what is going on? That, and I even went back to my recruitment ad. I was like, did I not make myself clear? I was like, what is wrong? Like, wh what is going on there? Then I asked one of my participants. I was like, okay, you said that you don't think yourself is out. You still think of yourself as closeted, but you indeed have disclosed to your parents and your parents had let you know that they knew and they disapproved of it, right? You have fights about it. Then why did you still think that you're closeted? And then she said, yeah, they know, but I just don't feel that I'm out. And then I said, okay, something interesting happening there. And then later she started talking about her girlfriend whose situation is very similar to this participant. So I said, oh, sounds like she could be my participant as well. And then, and then she said, no, she doesn't qualify. She has already disclosed. And then that was, that was the beginning of this entire inquiry about what is going on. Basically a question of what, what does it mean to be closeted and what does it mean to be out? If this participant that I'm talking to considered herself as closeted, but her girlfriend is out while their objective situation was very similar, then what does that mean? And fast forward to uh, 2017, an important event happened in 2017 in Taiwan, which was the 
uh, Supreme Court, the judicial court interpretation of our constitution that the unrecognition of same-sex marriage in Taiwan is unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court ordered the legislative yuan that you have two years from this day that I announced the unconstitutional nature of the civil code, you have two years to fix this problem. So you either amend the civil code so same-sex couple could get married like any heterosexual couple, or you can pass a special law for same-sex couple to get married. Just do whatever, but you have to do it. If nothing is done in two years time, civil code will just be amended automatically. So it was shortly after the interpretation of constitution came out. And during one of the parents support group meeting. So this is a picture kind of, you know, similar to the support, support group. Um, you cannot see, you cannot really see the people there, but it's kind of like that. So we have parents support group uh, meeting every uh, couple of weeks. And uh, it was during this one meeting right after the constitutional court's ruling that there was a new mother, like a newcomer, a mother that joined the group for the first time. So the mother introduced herself and said that, oh, I'm here because my daughter is lesbian. And, um, and then she said, I never used to uh, accept her, but now that there is a chance for her to get married, I want to know, right? And she said, because now the country, the state um, approves of my daughter, then I need to like catch up and learn how to be supportive of her. And then, you know, people are like, wow, you know, it's very touching. This mother uh, is willing to come and support her daughter. And then one of the other, so one other mother asked her, so when did your daughter come out to you? And the new coming mother replied, did you mean when did she tell me or when did I accept her? So as smart as you are, you can probably now guess that there are at least two elements in when when Taiwanese tones is say come out, there are two at least two meanings. One is disclosure, one is acceptance. So I started to I just want to figure out what is going on there. And the thing is, when I started to notice that there is a discrepancy, there's like something just not working in how we use coming out. I started to recall all the conversations that I have with my friends in the group and other friends about coming out. Actually, people usually will ask you first, what do you mean by coming out? Right? There is really not a straightforward answer or what you mean by coming out is, is entirely different from someone else's use of coming out. So I thought, OK, I just I just want to figure out what's going on. So that brings us to the uh, several research that I did on this topic. So the question is, OK, so this question is from my dissertation. So it has been, you know, it has been it has uh, evolved through years of research. But the actual question is, what does coming out mean to Taiwanese Tongzi? And I used constructivist grounded theory as, uh, as the guiding principle of data collection, data analysis. And grounded theory is, I think, the right approach to use because at the time there really wasn't much data on Taiwan and there wasn't much data you know, to really tease out the nature of coming out. So there was uh, two waves of interview data. So the first was done in 2014, and then I interviewed the same group of people in 2017. So there were 28 of them, uh, and their age group is from 22 to 38. And I chose this age group again because this is the age group where uh, people are more likely to get questions about marriage and, and, and children and your life plans and stuff like that. And then I did a third round of interview in uh, from 2018 to 2019 with 38 uh, Taiwanese Tongzi. Some of them are the same from my previous two waves of data collection, where there are most of the uh, most of them are uh, new participants. And I also interviewed 14 parents. One of them is actually an aunt. 
so an aunt that has a gay nephew, um, but she was very close to the nephew. Uh, that's why she also identified as you know, some, some kind of parent. So I interviewed 14 parents. And I also did a year of field observation in Taiwan Tongsu Highland Association, mostly in those uh, parent support group. So those were my data. And I used constructive grounding theory to analyze the data that I had. It was a lot of data. Uh, what came out of it was uh, the, my first publication, my first major publication in 2018 in family relations about this model that I found. Uh, it's called the scaffolding model. Um, but then later, right, so in 2019 uh, for my dissertation, I was at, because for the 2018 and the 2014 study, I only interviewed the Tongzi themselves. But if it's, you know, about them coming out or they trying to build this relationship with their parents, I got to talk to the parents as well. That's why I interviewed the parents and I also attended their uh, their support group meetings. And that was my dissertation in 2019. And it did win uh, the National Communication Association, which is the American uh, National Communication Association's Family Communication Division Best Dissertation Award. So uh, good thing for me because, you know, you wrote you put your heart and soul into research and you published it and you don't know whether people read it. So at least I know some people read this work. So what is it really? So of all the data that I have, of all the stories that I collected, and I tried to answer that question, the answer that I found, put very simply, is that I built a model called the scaffolding family conflict reconciliation model. Mouthful, I know this just a lot of fancy words. And uh, some of you might be wondering what is scaffolding. So scaffoldings are the things, like you know, the, the things you put outside a building when you're building this building, because you can't just go to like say, you know, 20 floors at the uh, 20, oh, in British, you, in, in UK, you call it differently. I don't know what, how you call it, but you know, if you're building a tall building, right? You have to start from uh, level one and then you have to, put the scaffolding on the outside so that you can go up to your goal. And after you reach the goal, right, you take out the scaffolding. So the key is, what is the goal, right? So you start from the ground and then there is a goal and then you scaffold your way through that. So this is a picture of scaffolding, but when it's applied to a family conflict reconciliation situation, what does it look like? So I'm going to present to you uh, the model with, you know, parts of the construct that I found. So first of, all, first of all, the important thing is to remember that this entire process happened under broader social, cultural, and political context. So it's very important to remember none of the, this happened in the vacuum, right? The, all the things that people do in this relationship that they have is informed by the broader social context. And also what they do would in turn inform this context. So it's a reciprocal relationship. So this model starts with that, the offspring. Uh, the reason I didn't use the word child is because when people see the word, ch the word child, they usually think of people, you know, underage, underage kids. And also because most of the study that you can find now about parent-child relationship about coming out mostly are about uh, teenagers, adolescents, or younger, younger kids. So, but I'm like, you know, people don't just magically learn how to do parent-child relationship when they become an adult, right? I think this relationship, you know, lasts entire life. And it's a little bit weird that most of the research about the parent-child relationship focus on only the uh, the underage kids. That's why I chose the word offspring, just to kind of signal that this is not about uh, a younger child. So the offspring would have some expectations about their lives, about what they want to do you know, in their, for their future and what they want out of their parents. Uh, a, a caveat before we go on uh, is that the people that I interview are people who want to have this, this relationship with their parents because there are some people who don't want this relationship 
uh, their relationship uh, was bumpy or there was no relationship to begin with, where they decided to cut ties. And, and that, that happens and that is not uncommon. But the group that I, so the people that I interview are people who care about the family relationship, they want to maintain this relationship, and that's why uh, they go into this process of scaffolding. Okay, so they have uh, expectations about themselves, but about their future, about their parents, and their parents also have expectations about themselves, about their own future, and also about their their offspring's future. There are things that they want their offspring to do. And this process starts because there is a discrepancy between the two sets of, of expectations, right? What I want and what you want are different. So there is a gap. And remember the building, like when we build a building, we start zero, like ground zero is a discrepancy and their goal is to finish whatever 20 floors of, uh, of a building. And in this relationship, the goal is to have a mutually intelligible acceptance. So what the kids want, what the parent want. Ideally, there is some kind of overlap that they can reach so that their relationship, relationship could be reconciled. And how do they reach the mutually intelligible acceptance? The first, uh, the first process they go through is something that I call a constant comparison of relating. I will explain later what those means. One thing I learned from academia is to use fancy words so that you sound smart. So I'm sorry if some of things are confusing. Um, but anyways, people go through a process called constant comparison of relating. And then that's a psychological process. And after that, they decide the scaffolding efforts that they decide to do in order for the gap to close so that they could reach you know, this zone of the overlapped acceptance. Okay. But uh, later I will talk about why this process actually could go on indefinitely for some people. So to put it in simple term, is the child wants something, the parents want something, what they want is different. So they would assess their different situation you consider different resources that I have, you know, gauge their own emotion and decide the things that they do in order for, you know, the other, the other side um, to probably listen to your, listen to me and stuff like that and eventually reach a zone where both feel okay about their relationship. And again, this process for some people goes on and on. Okay. So I'm going to break into, so the next part, I'm going to uh, break into three parts. The first is how this process begins, and then I'll focus on the middle part, right? The things that people do and the constant comparison of relating that they go through, and eventually to the, the right-hand side of this diagram, which is the both are okay part in the ongoing process. So firstly, how all this begins. When coming out is defined as disclosure, this process of coming out starts and ends with the disclosure. But my data, uh, my academic data, and also my experiences with Taiwanese Tongzi just indicates a very different process, right? So this discrepancy Okay, the sense of discrepancy, the sense that something is off, something is different, something is wrong, is actually the beginning point of a person's journey through this reconciliation. So for the child, it could be noticing that you have feeling for a same-sex friend, and then you, you realize that, okay, I might be different from other people. And for a parent, it could be noticing that something is different about your child, Maybe your your son uh, acts a little bit growy, or for parents it could be, you know, very interestingly, for a lot of gay participants in uh, for my study and a lot of friends that I have from the from the movement is that a lot of them have you know was outed 
right? They're exposed because the parents saw their web browsing history and they've been on some porn, a uh, gay porn site. And this is, you know, historically uh, important because when I grew up uh, in the, I was born in 1985, so I grew up during that time when internet was just a new thing. And most families in Taiwan would have maybe just one computer that's shared by the family. So everyone uses the same computer. And that is also why a lot of the parents discovered the gay son's gayness through the web browsing history. Um, and that was actually not a common thing for lesbian or uh, uh, bisexual women. But it is usually very common for gay men. Um, and I said it's very important historically. Uh, there's historical importance to that is because like, right now in this generation that we have now, Everyone has their own computer, everyone has their own phone. Uh, the chance for a gay person's web browsing history of gay porn to be discovered by parents is, has significantly decreased. So anyways, the, the child and the parents sense something different, and that's when the discrepancy kicks in. That's where the story begins. Okay. So something like, I might be different and my parents won't accept me, therefore, uh, you know, there's a long journey ahead of me. And parents could be suspicious, you know, they can make an inadvertent uh, or purposeful discovery, or they could be informed by a third party. Uh, in Taiwan, well, this was a debate. This has been a debate of whether a parent, a parent is allowed to uh, go through the parent, the, the child's belongings belongings, like can you read their diaries, can you go through their stuff? Right, right now there are competing discourses about whether a parent is, you know, is allowed to do that. But when I grew up in the, in the 90s, that was actually very common for parents to go through your own stuff. Um, and then there basically is no privacy and teachers can, teachers can go through your personal things as well. So it's actually not uncommon for parents to make the discovery or they are suspicious, therefore they go and look for, for, for proof that their child is different. Okay, so for um, a tonsu could be that, for a pen could be that, but the key thing is that this process does not, does not start with disclosure, rather it starts with a sense of discrepancy. And the very important thing is that um, when either side started to have this suspicion, have this you know, sense of discrepancy, they may make evaluation of the other side, but a lot of time they can make mistakes. Therefore, their projection of this process is also wrong. When I started recruiting uh, for my dissertation, uh, and I made sure that at least half of the participants that I talked to are not from the organization or from people that know in the organization. So I just want to make sure I talk to people who are engaged in activism and people who are not, because I think their, uh, their experiences are very different. So I was referred to, you know, a person, like a friend's friend, like it's a multiple degree of connection. Therefore, I'm sure that I don't know this person in person, like in real life. And that person got in contact with me and he said, yeah, I can, I can uh, be your participant. That person is a 30-year-old-ish gay man. And then he said, oh, my father is also very supportive of me. So I think my father can be your participant as well. And then he gave me his father's contact information. And he said, well, just, just text my dad. And I already told him. And he's OK, just uh, text him and you know, figure out time for you to talk to him. So I did. I text the father. Uh, I was left on red and then I text again and then I was left on red again and then, uh, the father didn't get back to me. So uh, after a week or two, I went back to that person and said, uh, could you let your father know that I left a message uh, trying to figure out time to talk to him? And then he apologized to me and said that, you know, apparently I was wrong. I thought that my, my, my dad was okay and then he just very open about it. But then when I checked with him again, again, uh, he said he doesn't want to be interviewed. He doesn't want to talk about it. And then this participant was actually very sad. And he was like, wait, I thought, you know, I thought my, my father is okay with me. 
why is he not okay being interviewed? So um, there is a lot of misjudgment at the beginning uh, and other uh, different cases when a, uh, a Tongzi offspring could, in, you know, because of some clues that have collected the way, decided that I think my parents will never, never accept me, therefore I need to do uh, this is and that in order for them to accept me. So when they finally reach that point, then they realize, oh, my parents are actually okay with me all along, or my parents actually knew for a very long time. So um, the reason I was, I'm talking about this is because this process for everyone is different, for every pair is different. And it depends on how they evaluate their initial situation, kind of decides the length and the, uh, the level of complexity of this process. So the middle part, the process, what is it like? How do people bring in, you know, like close the gap? Um, the first part of the, the middle, the, the process is what I call a constant comparison of relating in a scaffolding efforts. So constant comparison is actually a very commonly used analytical techniques for qualitative data. Right? So if you have ever done qualitative research, you may know a uh, constant comparison is when you have all your text and you started to find themes and codes and you compare to see, oh, are there any similarities? If there are, and then put them together, become a higher level code and category, and that's how you find themes in your data. But constant comparison of relating for personal relationship is a very different process. And there are different types of comparison. Okay. The first type, I call it personal experience as the base for comparison. So remember uh, now at least you know, a parent and a child is trying to find a way for their relationship to go on. And then, you know, they're, they, they need to know what's going on. They need to decide what to do. So for some parents, they will use their own experience as the baseline to evaluate the situation between the parents and the child. For example, uh, one of my participants, uh, she is a pansexual woman. That means so she has dated men and she has dated women. Um, so for the mother, so for this participant's mo mother, the mother always just see her as a heterosexual person who sometimes dates girls. So now you can see, you know, it's a very different thing. So for, for the Tongzi offspring, she said, no, I am a pansexual. Um, she only told the mother that she's bisexual because she thinks pansexual is a little bit too complicated. She said, I'm bisexual, I date men and I date women. And the mother is like, no, you're just a le you're just a heterosexual person who sometimes dates a girl. So the mother, uh, even though the mother has known about her daughter's sexuality, the mother has for you know more than a decade trying to push the daughter to get married to a man. And the daughter would say, I can't just marry someone I don't love. Right? I can't I can't do that. Like, how can I marry someone I don't love just because, you know, it makes you happy? And the, mo and the mother would say that love is overrated. Right? It doesn't matter. Just find a man who's got money and just get married. Right. Because when you're old, love will fade and it's the financial stability that matters. And the reason the mother believes in that is because that's that's just, you know, the, the story that she went through. The mother fell in love with uh, her husband, which is the father, uh, when they were really early, uh, really young, about like uh, 20 years old. They fell in love madly. They got married within a year. Then they had three babies. And 30 years later, she was like, OK, I don't feel love toward my husband anymore. And it doesn't matter. So she always told her daughter that, OK, you know, she would tell she would tell her daughter her story and said that because it happens for me, then it has to be the truth, the truth, right? Because it happened for me. Therefore, don't insist on love. Just find a man and get married. And the same goes for the the tongs of option. Sometimes they will use their own one experience as the baseline for everyone else. 
and you know, in that case, it's actually difficult for them to talk to one another because they only use their own example, their experience as the, the, as the standard. And a second type of comparison, social com comparison, which is actually uh, a long established theory in 1954 by Fassinger and a lot of theorists after that. So social comparison uh, can be roughly divided into two kinds. Upward comparison is when you compare to someone similar to your situation, but are doing better. So you're looking at people who are doing better, and therefore you feel bad for yourself. And there's downward comparison, when you compare to someone in a similar situation, but doing worse, so that you could feel better about yourself. So in the process of trying to close the gap, sometimes the parents or the child will use this kind of social comparison to understand their situation and to decide what to do. So uh, one of the participants, uh, he was texting. So because in Taiwan, people use Line as the, like a chat group, it's like WhatsApp or like Messenger. And, and usually a family would have a chat group. So this participant sometimes will share information about Tongzi movement in Taiwan in the family chat group. And then one time, his mother responded in the chat group that, okay, I'm okay for you to be gay, but can you not talk about this so much in the, you know, in the family chat group? And then she said, your cousin is also gay. Why can you be like your cousin who is very quiet, right? He's gay, but he doesn't bother anyone. So the mother did some kind of comparisons like my son gay, uh, his cousin also gay. But the cousin is a better version of gay because he's quieter, right? He's not trying to make a scene or like trying to fight for his right or something like that. Um, and because of the comparison that the mother did, she decided to stop her son from sharing those information. And that causes the relationship to kind of drift even further apart. Um, and the third kind is called measuring against the norm. So when my participant talked about, oh, the society is like this, uh, or everyone does that, or uh, people are supposed to do this and that, so they are kind of invoking some kind of social norm, and that's when they're measuring against the norm. Uh, and common norms are heteronormativity, which is the idea that people are, people are heterosexual, and people should behave heterosexually, and heterosexuality is uh, the standard and should be on the only thing that exists. And homonormativity, uh, if we have time, we'll come back to that. Um, and, but there's other type of norms that are often referred to in their stories, for example, patriarchy and compulsory marriage. So compulsory marriage is the idea that uh, even if you're, you're uh, tongzi, you're still expected to get married because marriage is one of the most important thing in life. And there are other types of marriage that people could go through. One type is called formality marriage, which is uh, more common in China than it is in Taiwan. But in, in Taiwan, sometimes people do that too. So formality marriage is when a gay man and a lesbian woman get married so that they could you know, fulfill their responsibility as, a, as somebody's offspring and sometimes they would even have a baby together. Um, but they know from the beginning that, okay, this is just a formality, we get married. And for, there are some studies that show, sometimes the parents are aware of the fact that this is formality only. You know, these two are, uh, there's a lesbian and a gay, and they're okay with it because the important thing is that they get married. And there are other type of marriage. One very interesting type is called ghost marriage or called spirit marriage, which was very common in Taiwan in the past, but even to this day, people still practice uh, ghost marriage or call spirit marriage. And a very important reason for people to do that is because if a woman, uh, when a woman marries to uh, marry a, a man and enters the man's family, then the woman, this is a Taoism, uh, tradition, but Taoism is the most common type of folk religion in Taiwan. So the idea is that a woman has to be married in order for her spirit after she dies to enter the husband's family's, uh, you know, spirit temple, like shrine. 
So a woman has to get married because if you don't do that, after you die, your your spirit will just wander. You cannot be in your natal family, which is your family of origins, blind because the the rules just doesn't like. So the rule is just you have to get married and become part of your husband's family. So what happens when a woman dies before she got married, right? So that happens, especially in the past, when people's mortality rates higher. So if a woman dies before she gets married, then the family will still need to marry the daughter out so that her spirit could enter a certain family shrine. So uh, a common story, even now it's still common knowledge is that uh, the family will sometimes leave out red, red envelope with money in it or some valuables just on the road. So if a man walks by and pick up the red envelope, then that man has to marry the dead daughter. Um, and it's okay if the man is already married. And sometimes, if the uh, sometimes the the dead girl's family will find a family with a dead son, and they will get married both as ghosts. But that would still work for the women's spirit to go into the husband's family shrine. So all these different stories just tell you how important it is for people, you know, that people think of fam- uh, of marriage in Taiwan. And the fourth kind is called measuring against authority. So any kind of authority, a, a doctor, uh, a uh, a PhD, um, uh, wait, what are other kinds of authority? Just any kind of authority. So t- sometimes the parents would think of authorities' opinion as, you know, the baseline for them to understand their situation and just decide what to do. One of the most fascinating stories is uh, comes from the mother that I interviewed. So the mother has a lesbian daughter, and the mother said, when my daughter was very young, when she was just like eight years old, and one day the mother went to work. So she went to the office, sat down, started you know doing her own stuff, and one of her colleagues just walked to walked to her and said, God. So one of the gods from a Taoism. So so Taoism got there are thousands of them. So one of the gods wanted me to tell you that your daughter is a boy spirit in a girl's body, and the God wants you to accept your daughter. And then the colleague just turned around and walked away. And the mother wasn't even a very religious person, but the mother was like, okay, if that's a message from God, then I probably should should follow it. And the thing is, at the time, the, the mother has never brought her daughter to the workplace. So there's no way for her colleagues to, knew, to, uh, to know about her daughter or to even know her daughter. So for the mother, she was like, I'm not religious, but you know, this is very partic- uh, you know, very weird situation, so I better follow it. So somehow, even before the daughter realizes that she is a lesbian, the mother has already decided to accept her. Um, so the mother told the daughter this story about like 10, 20 years after, after that, when the daughter decided to talk about this with her mom, and the mom was like, well, this actually happened. And the daughter was like, what, how, how did this happen? Well, but it worked out for the best. And the last type that I identify from my, from my uh, data is uh, what I call putting things in perspective. This is a, like an idiom. But when negative, like really bad negative thing happen, then people usually adjust it how they evaluate their relationship. One of my participants, very sadly, her sister uh, committed suicide a couple of years ago because, well, she was going through a breakup and was uh, too much for her, so she uh, killed herself. So my participant's mother, of course, was devastated. So after that, before that, the mother was, you know, not very supportive of her daughter being lesbian, but after that, the mother told them, okay, now I just want all of you to be happy. As long as you're alive, you can date whoever you want, marry whoever you want. I just want you to be alive. And that became a really important change in the relationship. And sometimes, you know, these different kinds of comparisons come from different kinds of discourses. And when there are competing discourses, people could go back and forth between, you know, how to feel and what to do. Um, because there are 
proximal relate or proximal discourses that happen within their relationship, their distal discourses, right? The the social, cultural, and legal discourses. So one of the mother, she she thought that she, she thought she was very close to her daughter, um, and then she was kind of okay with her daughter's sexuality, but a couple years ago, after the judicial court's interpretation of the civil code, there was a huge wave of opposition that people, there are, you know, there's organized opposition to Tongzi rights. And their discourses became very, very powerful, especially to parents. They're saying that if, you know, we allow gay, uh, we allow same-sex people to get married, then all of these bad things would happen, you know, HIV would rise and then uh, birth rate uh, birth rate would fall. And just like, you know, they would tear down the fabric of society and stuff like that. So the mother, she was very supportive of her daughter, but now she also listened to this kind of different discourses. And then she started to not know what to do about their relationship. Um, and another very interesting phenomenon that I found is called polysemy. Polysemy is a linguistics idea that means one word has multiple meaning at the same time. So the idea, so the words such as marriage, love, responsibility, happiness, meant drastically different things to different generations of people or to just to different people. And when there is polysemy in a relationship, people may feel like they're talking to each other because they use the same word, but they're actually talking past one another. So uh, a mother that I interviewed, her own mother uh, actually came with a mother's mother. So, the, uh, so her mother who has already passed away, if she was alive, she would be like 110 uh, now, 100 years old. So. The, the mother that I interviewed talked about her own mother, and then she said that her mother actually came from China to Taiwan during the 1949 retreat. And the mother only came because the mother met the father because the father was uh, a KMT soldier who was, you know, fleeing to Taiwan after they lost a civil war to a uh, communist party. So on the way that he was going, coming to Taiwan, he was passing through a village. And then uh, a two older person saw the father and saw that man and said, could you marry my daughter and take my daughter to Taiwan with you? Because we don't want her to suffer here. And they were like, well, if you go to Taiwan, most likely you're not going to get a wife. Um, but so if you marry my daughter, guarantee a wife in this new land. So. So the mother actually married this person who was just passing through the village as part of the retreat. So they got married, they moved to Taiwan. So I asked this mother who was in, uh, in, in her early 70s, and I was like, so for your mother, marriage means survival. And I asked her, do you think you're able to do that, to marry someone just to survive? And then she said, it was actually difficult for me to imagine that. And I asked her, what does it mean? You know, what does marriage mean to you? So she said for her, marriage means responsibility. You have to do it because that is what you do as a person, right? And then uh, this is one of the rare pair that I also interview the daughter. So I have a daughter-mother pair. So I, I asked the daughter about, you know, what her mother said. And then she said for her, marriage means love. So you can see the same word marriage means survival, responsibility, and love and you know, self-actualization. But if, if, um, if they're not aware of polysemy in their relationship, it will become very difficult for them to move toward reconciliation. And I also wanna highlight uh, some feminist intersectionality that I found in my study. The first uh, is the feminist intersectionality of the Tongzi offspring. Remember at the beginning I said, I'm not gonna use LGBTQ, rather I will use Tongzi. And the reason is the label LGBTQ plus in the context 
of parent-child relationship, parent-child relationship reconciliation, actually is not very helpful. For a lot of for the parents, what they care about are three things. First of all, is my Tongzi child a son or daughter? Because a son and a daughter comes with different expectations, and there are different things you want them to do. And the second level is. Is my child acting normal, or can, or can people tell just by looking at my child that my child is different, right? So that's the second level. Are they behaving normally? I'm just using the word that the parents use. And the third level is, does my child love just one sex? That means, does my child、uh, is my child gay or lesbian, or? Does my child like both sexes, or more than you know both sexes? Because if it's the first situation, it's actually easier for the parents to accept because they will think that there is no choice, right? My my child likes the same sex. I better find a way to be okay with that. But if a child could also date or like a, a,、uh, the opposite sex, then Sometimes it becomes very difficult for the parents to let it go because they're always holding on to the hope. And another、uh, intersectionality is of the parents. I did find in my research that、um, people of different class, a higher socioeconomic class and lower socioeconomic class, their power dynamics, the parent-child power dynamics,、uh, could be quite different.、Um, and also, one. Very interesting thing that I found is called resistance by proxy. S- some of my、uh, part, some of the mothers that I interview, they said when they found out that their daughter、uh, is lesbian or bisexual woman, they were actually pretty relieved because they're like, okay,、um, because they themselves suffer a lot in this patriarchal system. As Somebody's daughter-in-law, because daughter-in-law is the lowest possible rank in the patriarchal system, and these mothers they suffer so much as the daughter-in-law. And but because because it's their responsibility to also make sure all her children married well, right? The daughters marry well and sons marry well, heterosexually. And some of the mother told me that they actually. Can, they can sometimes encourage their lesbian or bisexual、uh, bisexual daughter to not marry a man because they don't want their daughter to go through, you know, the patriarchal system. So by by foregoing their responsibility as a mother to make sure the daughter ma- marries well, they actually resist this、uh, this structure by proxy by the proxy of their daughter. Okay. So I'm going to go through the final part. Go to the final part. I hope to end real quick. So the final part.、Uh, important things to remember is that remember. Okay. So the parent,、uh, the the kids want something. The parents could want something, and hopefully there is some overlap. But sometimes there could be no overlap. And the key. Term to note to pay attention to is the mutually intelligible, because actually, what what people think of as acceptance could actually differ a lot. So for the parents, they could give out what I call compartmentalized acceptance. So it could be compartmentalized along the way of emotion, attitude, behavior, and cognition. So a parent could be behaviorally accepting, but not understand what's going on, or a parent could be very very sad about it, but still decide to、uh, you know show up at you know some kind of gay event for for her gay son. So for the parent, what they give is still acceptance, just that is one part of acceptance. So there are. Different kinds of situation. I'm not, I'm not going to go into details, but for the offspring, sometimes the compartmentalized acceptance feels like discounted accept acceptance to them.、Uh, a lot of the Tongzi offspring would, you know, hope their parents could be like this, could be like that. 
So when the parents do not, you know, display that kind of acceptance a Tongzi offspring want, they would feel like, okay, this is not really acceptance. Okay. And there are different, also different stories about how they deal with this kind of situation. Um, and actually the situation could reverse sometimes for the parents will want the Tongzi child to do something and the Tongzi child would feel like, I already do what you asked me to do. Why is it that's still not enough for you? So the important, the important lesson is that, you know, acceptance can come in different shapes and forms. And it's very important for people to understand, you know, which type or which compa compartments am I experiencing that or am I expressing that for the other person to know? Okay, so I'm going to uh, jump to this other page and go to the final page is the, I think the contribution of this model. So remember this model is built against the backdrop that first of all, there is very little research on this topic outside the so-called uh, US and West Europe context. Most of the study that you can find is done in that social context. So very little done in this part of the world, uh, very little done in Taiwan. And another important background to remember is that uh, coming out has been defined as disclosure for so long. It's like, it's how people see it in, in the academia, and it's harder for them to kind of jump through that. But my study highlights the fact that, you know, coming out is not an event, but rather it's a process. Okay, so uh, yes, one, uh, first contribution is that my research redefined coming out. It's not an individual event, but a, it's a processual, iterative, and relational undertaking. And then uh, it challenges this assumption, and it builds a model using Taiwan's uh, data, and it emphasizes on the adult child parent re relationship other, uh, rather than most of the studies that focus on underage childhood. And very importantly, it legitimizes parents' agency because in current literature, most of the time, it's the the child's disclosure that kind of set up this entire thing, right? So if the child doesn't disclose, then parents' story cannot come in the picture. But actually, parents' agency is very important in this process as well. And also, the idea of relational selfhood, uh, as opposed to the an individualistic understanding of self is that uh, at least for the participants that I interview, their self-identity a lot of time is built upon their relationship with the parent and the parents' the relationship with the, ch with the child. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult to tease them apart. It's important to see them in a relational sense. And then uh, showcase the importance of a communicative approach. So. In this, in this event or in this behavior, there's a lot of you know nuances in it that worth that's worth attention. And finally, uh, the theoretical, methodological, and practical implication of this study. I want to focus on the methodological. This is not just a like you know attempt to reconceptualize coming coming out, but rather method, method, uh, methodological is also very important because a lot of the study the recruitment criteria is you have to experience the disclosure already, right? So uh, you have to say like experience disclosure uh, within five years, then you can participate in my study. But a lot of time there is no disclosure, right? Or, you know, a lot of time the parents already know, but the child isn't disclosed or just for any kind of reason, if you if we use disclosure as a recruitment standard, we're actually leaving out a lot of different things going on. And this is not just for Taiwanese. Actually, in the 1960s, in the American study by Ponce, uh, they already identified the idea, you know, called like you know, sweeping under the rock, right? And then in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, there are actually studies done in America that kind of recognize this fact that sometimes there is no disclosure. Sometimes people just know or they suspect, but because they operationalize coming out as disclosure and their method 
has to ex 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 uh, exclude a lot of people. And therefore, um, this study, even though it uses Taiwanese um, data, I think it invites conversation and invites rethinking how we do research in other contexts as well. So I'm um, just going to go through the last point is some limitations that I think needs pay needs uh, attention. The first is that the cohort difference, the cohort effect, is quite apparent in Taiwanese Tongzi uh, generations. So for my generation, again, I am now in my late thirties. I grew up uh, with a lot of information because I grew up. I was born. Uh, I was born into the martial law era. So when I was born, Taiwan still under martial law, right? But then uh, soon after that, the martial law was lifted and we were able to receive a lot of new information. That's when the discourse of coming out came into Taiwan. So I grew up with idea of coming out. But uh, Amy Brenner's uh, ethnography of Taiwan, Tongzi, and a lot of other study realized that, for example, an older generation, an older cohort, actually doesn't see coming out as necessary or even a thing. And a younger cohort will now experience a whole new different situation. So just to pay attention to that when you apply the finding of this study. And that will be all. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic, Rita. That was, that was a really fascinating um, uh, uh, talk. You brought a really different angle. We've had a lot of um, uh, talks on that talk to issues over the last decade or so, but this, this was a really, very um, uh, different angle that we hadn't really kind of uh, covered before. And I really loved the way you kind of took us through that kind of the personal journey about how you got there, uh, how you dealt with um, the various challenges and how you linked the really rich um, fieldwork data to the, the theories, because you're dealing with quite a lot of theory, theoretical um, uh, kind of concepts there. So for me, that was that was um, really fascinating. Um, I think because of time, we're going to have to extend this one a, a little bit, um, so we've got enough time for uh, for questions. So let me open with um, a kind of a combination of um, the first question that BU's raised, um, and maybe something that I was one of my kind of numerous questions. So BU's question asks about. I mean, to be you, did you want to kind of come in with your uh, question? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, fascinating, and I can see the research is really solid. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I, I'm just fascinated by your fieldwork because you talk so much about mother's um, uh, reaction and response. And mm -hmm. of course, you did touch upon a little bit on fathers, but I'm just interested to know what's the difference between two parents? And and mm -hmm. and what's the uh, characteristics? Uh, is it really gender based? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually a known phenomenon that mostly uh, it's mothers that will show up in support group meetings. It's mothers that you know will become vocal about that, and then most of the time, uh, the the children would when they do disclose, they usually disclose to the mother first or only to the mothers. So I did have three, yeah, I did have three fathers that I interviewed. But one thing that I found is also like a very gendered, you know, nature of labor of this parental neighbor labor, is that mother usually carry on carry on their shoulder a lot of the burdens. Sometimes is there imagined burden that if my child is gay, there's something wrong with my, you know there's something wrong with me. There must be something that I did wrong. Um, and Taiwan Tongzi Haolan Association published uh, all the questions that the parents ever ask in their 20 years of you know service, the top five. The first one is, the first one of all the 20 years of question is, can my child become normal again? And then the second, by mother is what did I do wrong? Yeah, and then some of them would even go so back, like so far back to when they were pregnant. They're like, there must be something I did wrong when I was pregnant that made my child like that. Um, 
there are actually more than one mother that said it must be because I was pregnant with a daughter, but I wanted a son, right? Because under the patriarchal pressure, they have to have sons, right? If you don't produce a son, you're actually useless in this family. And they were under so much pressure to, you know, give birth to a son. They were hoping for a son, but they were carrying a daughter and they blame themselves for wanting that. They think that it must be that, that kind of transform my baby in the uterus or something. And then my son, uh, my daughter is like that. And some of them, um, their rationale, they will try to rationalize this phenomena. And it's usually the mother, because they see the, the child's failure as part of their failure, right? Because this idea of relational selfhood, right? If like my, me as a mother, I only completed my journey or my responsibility if my child, you know, did all the things that they have to do. So it's the mother that usually goes out of their way to try to rationalize this thing that happened. Uh, one of the mother uh, believed that it was because of the Chinese medicine that she was taking when she was pregnant. Right? She was said there must be some kind of chemical in the Chinese medicine. And then, but somehow she was like, okay, then it's not my fault, right? It's the Chinese medicine fault. Even though I shouldn't be taking the Chinese medicine, but at least it's an external factor. So mother, because of the pregnancy and because of their role as a mother in the patriarchal society, the mothers usually take on more responsibility and more guilt and in this process. And of the three fathers that I interview, yeah, I would say that they are, you know, really rare in, in you know, the 20 years of work that, uh, that Hotline has done, that we have very few fathers that came to the meeting, that came for help or stayed to provide service. One of the, you know, one time there was this, you know, a couple, so a husband and a wife, and uh, they were from the South. So it was actually difficult for them to come to Taipei, so they had to take the day off. And so the uh, father worked in um, in agriculture, I think. So they just found out that their uh, son is gay, again through web browsing history. So that tells you a lot. <laughs> just just clear your web browsing history. So, but during the interaction, it was just a, very painful to see because the father was like, so the father actually said. I'm always busy working, trying to provide for the family. It is your responsibility to raise the kids right, and then you didn't do it right. And that's why our son is gay now. And then so she, he was blaming the mother. And then the mother was, of course, very sad, but the mother also blame, blames herself. And then we were there like trying to listen to their story, but also try to intervene. But I think that was actually a very classic power dynamics between uh, husband and wife. In my study. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Liana, did you want to come in with your question? Um, I think your mic's not on. Yes, Can Liana, raise her hand. Yes. Okay, in that case, you can, um, Liana's going to type her question. So while she's okay. typing, let me come in with um, uh, with my question, because one of the things I found really interesting was you mentioned the impact of the constitutional court ruling on mm -hmm. uh, one of the parents. So I was kind of mm -hmm. curious about, because you talked about your project being ongoing and mm -hmm. the uh, legalization occurs in May, so almost like the time you graduate. So mm -hmm. uh, did you see a big impact in... Um, of that legalization? Because I think one of the things we see is parents joining wedding ceremonies. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, and I was kind of just curious about, even this, though this is kind of can we post um, mm -hmm. dissertation, what, what was the effect of, of this on the parents? Yeah, that's why I am collecting more data now, because I do want to see, you know, how, you know, how the, the change of law impacts their relationship. Um, so from what we can see, so right now in Taiwan, there are, I think up to last month, there are actually 6,000 uh, pairs of same-sex couple that got married. Uh, about 4,000 of them, more than 4,000 are uh, lesbian couples. So somehow lesbians love marriage more than gay men, I guess. Um, so if there are 6,000 pairs of people that get married, 
then at least there are 6,000 households, like parents who are aware of that. And it's actually, especially for younger, uh, younger uh, or those who still live in their parents' house, because in Taiwan, it's still a norm that you don't, you actually stay with your parents until you get married, right? You're, you're not considered an actual adult until you get married. So in some, you know, during Chinese New Year, uh, you can still get red envelope, no matter how old you are, as long as you're not married. You can see the child and you can receive the red envelope. So for those, uh, for those Tongzi who live in the parents' uh, household, they actually, because in Taiwan, we have something called the household registration system. So each house actually has an actual booklet that shows who belongs to this family. And then you need that piece of paper to get married so that you can be either added to a certain family's household or be removed from it. That's why if a younger Tongzi who still is in the same household wants to get married, there is simply no way that the parents don't know. Um, and divorce rate uh, for the first month was actually pretty high. <laughs> People got married and then they got divorced. But um, after two years now, the divorce rate has decreased, but marriage rate has uh, has right has risen. Yeah, so I am curious as uh, you know how those parents are dealing with it. But a prominent discourse that we observe, because after the um, the same sex marriage law was passed, right? We still do a lot of the talks and you know we go to different schools and talk to parents and stuff like that yeah what we did we did see that the the change of law for a lot of parents were a powerful way for them to understand what's going on so it's like if the country says it's okay then it's okay for me to be okay with it mm -hmm. right because for some parents are like even if i'm okay with it the law says it's not okay therefore I shouldn't feel okay about it, so they're conflicted. So now they have kind of like they have the law behind them to to want to accept their child. Um, so for those parents, we're actually uh, it's a useful way for them to navigate their, their relationship. And for some parents, actually, um, like I said, because they compartmentalize, you know, their acceptance. For a lot of parents, they have no idea what is going on with their child, especially if a child insists to use a label like I'm a, I'm a queer person or I'm non-binary for the parents it's like I have no idea what that means but if the law says it's okay then it's okay and sometimes they will use that to kind of defend their child in front of other relatives right relatives are saying something like no nope, the law says it's okay so I think somehow I don't know do we believe in our government more <laughs> is that why <laughs> People kind of just like, okay, if the governor says good, then it's good. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely uh, I will collect more data for that. And Liana, did you want to try again with your mic? Uh, yeah, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. All right. Uh, so, thank you so much, Rita. Uh, I. I am the director of uh, GW's uh, TURP, so I'm really, really looking forward to actually oh, seeing you yes. in person. Uh, but uh, my interest, my research interest is in uh, uh, the well, uh, the well-being of transgender people mm -hmm. in Taiwan and, and their family members' reactions and acceptance. And I know that the Tongzhi uh, Hotline Association they also host uh, peer support groups for transgender and gender non-conforming people. Um, and a recent interview that I had with a trans man in Taiwan indicated that they, they actually have, uh, they form line groups through which they share strategies mm -hmm. of coming out and, and you know, strategizing their, their, mm -hmm. their, their, their way to disclose their identity to their parents. So I'm very interested in knowing whether uh, and, and since uh, you know the coming out, uh, uh, share the sharing of coming out strategies among um, uh, gay and lesbian folks may may have uh, uh, had a longer history. So I, I don't know if there is a certain kind of a borrowing or mutual support or, or informing, you know, uh, among uh, the different groups of uh, uh, gender and and uh, sexual and minority groups. 
Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm gonna see you this summer. So uh, very <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Looking forward Actually, to seeing. It. Yeah. Transgender right after. So right now, it's what people call post same sex marriage era, and uh, the post same sex marriage era. One of the most important topics is the transgender right. Uh, and the, the other one being the uh, gender education, gender quality education. So transgender right is one that is kind of like under heated debate because the first case that one. Uh, so basically in Taiwan now, a transgender person, if you want to change your gender marker on your official document, you have to go through the entire set of operation. From head to toe, everything has to be changed in order for you to get your marker changed. But uh, the end of last year or earlier this year, uh, one person that filed for, like, I think, anyways, uh, she's a transgender woman. She wants to change her gender marker, but she hasn't gone through the surgery. So she uh, kind of, I think she sued the government. She's like, you can't, you can't make me do that. And then she won. She won the case. So now people are like, okay, are we on the way to change this law entirely? Are now, are are people now able to change their gender marker without a surgery? So now it's a heated debate. Um, but from my research and also related research about transgender right and also LGBTQ, is that. Um, Actually, sometimes it's easier for people to accept transgender person than uh, homosexual. Because if you're transgender, okay, it falls under something called the discourse of choice. Transgender issue is kind of shaped under this discourse to be they don't have a choice, right? They're born into the wrong body. This is a very common discourse. They're born into a wrong body, like a soul in the wrong body, and they don't have a choice. So people actually would, would you know, sympathize with person without a choice much more than you choose to do this. And also, if you transition to the entirely opposite sex, then somehow you're still following the binary discourse. You're still following the binary rule, right? You just kind of flip to the other side, but you're not trying to uh, dismantle this, this, you know, entire system. So non-binary person, harder to understand, harder to justify, but transgender person, especially those who have gone through surgeries and have their marker change officially, um, sometimes are easier for people that, to accept. And that's also why, you know, for a so for gay and, and lesbian, so single direction sexual attraction, mm -hmm. sometimes are easier for people to accept because again, they don't have a choice. You're born this way, right? The discourse of born this way is so powerful. So they don't have a choice, right? So, you know, they're already going through a lot of different, you know, difficulties which you support them. But for bisexual person, it's mm -hmm. like you have a choice then why are you choosing to do the wrong thing? Mm. So under um, so under these different influences, I think transgender person, you know, in within transgender community, I use the word community very loosely because mm. it, every movement, every group of people, there's just so much within group variation. But in Taiwan, uh, Hotline is now devoting a lot of their time uh, for transgender advocacy this year, start, starting this year. So for this year, next year, they actually form a whole new group just to uh, promote transgender rights. Mm -hmm. um, but outside hotline, there are different kinds of transgender community. Um, and also in the past year, I think the past five years, there are several influencers who are transgender and they're transgender women. And they are what we would call, you know, past successful. So mm -hmm. when you look at them, there's no way for, for you to tell that they are not uh, biologically, you know, they're not assigned as sex at birth. Mm -hmm. right? So they are, uh, they pass, they cross that border completely. And also they are really, really pretty. And mm -hmm. so the, you know, so this 
population. I, th I think this community has now an increased visibility, just that you know representation matters. So those transgender who don't look like that, we sometimes feel like, okay, then you know, I'm not pretty enough, or they try very hard to look that way. So um, I think my short answer is there are different groups of people who are working on this matter and they take different approaches and sometimes their opinions conflict. Um, so, you know, just like same-sex marriage, there actually there was actually a lot of debate about the strategy or even whether we should do it or not. Um, starting from like early 2010s. And there are different groups that just like, okay, we should, we should not push same-sex marriage, we should push for the, uh, the demolish, uh, demolition of marriage as an institution. Uh, and sometimes I wish you just push for, you know, partnership and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, a lot of debate within the groups. Okay, Thank we've you. got a few more questions uh, coming in. Uh, David, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, Rita, thank you very much. It was excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, really, really interesting. I wanted to ask, in your research or in your opinion, is, uh, there, is there such thing as um, silent disclosure when in, in the terms of coming out to parents? Or does, for your research, did it have to include verbal dialogue? Um, you talk about leaving the website browser open. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a lot of people, when I used to live in Taiwan, uh, parents would look at their diaries, but sometimes that diary was intentionally left open on a certain page. And my friend would know, for example, that their parent would read it, but then there was no ongoing conversation uh, from that. Yet there was a recognition uh, in some way, an unspoken recognition, that both parties knew um, that that had happened, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. That is actually one of my key arguments, is that a lot of time there is no disclosure at all. And people might reach that overlap acceptance without ever talking about it, without mm. explicitly acknowledging anything, right? A lot of time the, the child would just bring home the girlfriend, bring home the boyfriend. And the parents would know what's going on and they don't talk about it. And they would kind of, you know, sense each other out. And uh, yeah, in, in I think 15 years ago, Hotline published their first book. It's called Dear Mom and Dad, I Am Gay. I'm, I'm Tong Zhi. And then that actually became the tool for, you know, secretly coming out or silently coming out for a lot of Tong Zhi my age. We'll buy the book, put it somewhere, obvious right hoping that the parents would see um and uh and the, actually very interestingly one of the mother <laughs> interview because she actually found out about the son uh son being gay when the son was very young and then she was like i'm ready for him to come out to me but the the, the son was so nervous about it so the mother actually went by those books put it everywhere in the house hoping the son will pick up the hint that mama knows and mama's okay with it. But, but the son was so, still so afraid. So about 10 years after that, the mom finally convinced the son to go to the support group together to hotline. And then that's when they finally talk about it. And the mom was like, did you not see all the signs that let you? Did you not see all the rainbow flag I put everywhere? And then the books and everything and the son still burst out crying because he was still so scared. Uh, of mm -hmm. being kicked out of the house because that was the discourse that he was receiving. So um, actually for the majority of my participants, there was no explicit discussion mm -hmm. or this explicit discussion only came after they both feel that their relationship is in a place where they feel okay with. Mm -hmm. I really love this term, mutually uh, intelligible acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things that in, in our relationship, we've always referred to it in a long, in long form. It's like, you know, your mum knows, mum knows, you know, 
that she knows, but there mm -hmm. is never a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And yet that process of acceptance has definitely grown, definitely grown. And you can mm -hmm. see that in many, um, in many, in a demonstrated in many ways, it might be just a, a hug at the airport or them even treating you like a son-in-law, but it, but the conversation has never happened. Um, yeah. So that that process of of mutually uh, intelligible acceptance um, increases without a conversation almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Thank you. Anyway, it's been yeah, really good. I can't, yeah, I can't tell whether it, it's like a Western Eastern kind of you know differences. I don't I don't think the binary works really well when we put people's lived experiences. But I do think there is a trend that say in America, people are indeed more verbal in their mm -hmm. relationship. They tend to be more verbal, but in Taiwan, people are not. And people a lot of times do things you know, implicitly and hoping the other person will pick up some cues or they don't think you know, verbal expression is necessary. So I do think maybe you know, in, in a culture like you know, Caucasian, you know, white American, middle-aged white American maybe, it does happen to, you know, to them that, oh, they would sit down their parents and say, mom, dad, I'm gay. Maybe it does work for them. But even within America, there are so many different cultures, like, you know, the Hispanic immigrants, right, and the immigrants from uh, East Asian countries in, I don't know, East European countries and or South European. It's just so many different kinds of cultures, but it is the uh, the so-called white, the Caucasian, middle-aged Caucasian uh, American stories are usually featured. Also because of methodological limitation, right? Sometimes it's just easy to do, say, survey research with your college students, just, you know, because they're your captive survey fillers. Right? Just have them do the survey, it's just easier. So, like, a cumulative effect is that we oftentimes see the stories of certain group of people, but then we ignore other kinds of possibilities. Okay, because of time, I think what we're going to have to do is to kind of um, bunch up, I think, three questions. So let me just summarize a couple of that come in the chat, and then I'll give, mm -hmm. uh, I'll pass on to Raza for her question. So um, uh, Josh has asked about the um, impact of Taiwanese celebrities um, being open about their sexual orientation and how mm -hmm. that has helped uh, children to discuss uh, issues with their, their parents. And then mm -hmm. Cass asks the question about um, 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 uh, whether being uh, non-normative gender identity is more easily acceptable than non-normative uh, sexualities. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Cass, did you want to kind of just um, elaborate a bit on, on, on what you meant there? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was um, I was thinking this through as Rita was was answering um, Liana's question, um, and it's something um, sort of I've seen. I've, I'm kind of I've, I'm transitioning um, from a research project based around China and kind of trying to um, learn a bit more about Taiwan because I'm actually able to to get to Taiwan this this summer. Um, and something I've seen is is in kind of Chinese LGBTQ communities um, in kind of Beijing and, and so on um, very often um, kind of there's a there's a difference between non-normative genders so kind of transgender and whether that's and, and non-binary people um, it seems to be more difficult to accept for families and so on than non-normative sexualities and I kind of wondered um, uh, what you think about whether that's sort of something that you've experienced as well and, and I suppose I think you already answered it really mm -hmm. um, but um, but yeah I, I, I thought that that was really interesting the kind of discourse of, of, of choice around gender and sexuality and, and we can't choose our gender but we choose our sexuality and actually maybe moving past that that idea of choice mm -hmm. um, is really where we make progress um, so yeah I I'd be um, delighted to talk to you more at some point about this. Yeah, definitely. Um, I will love and, that. And I'd yeah. love, love to hear it. And great yeah, to hear you're going to go to Taiwan as well. Yeah, that's and, great. And, um, so, yeah. 
Uh, so Rita, if you want to hang on a second, we, we'll, let me just mm -hmm. bring in the, yeah. um, um, the final question. Then you can kind of pick and choose mm -hmm. within a kind of limited yeah. time, because I think we need to wrap up um, yeah, by about one. But Raza, do you want to come in? Oh, uh, uh, Raza, your, your mic. I think you're still on mute. No, oh no, we still can't hear you. Um, yeah. Um, so, Rita, did you want to? Um, uh, uh, did you have any responses to um, uh, Josh and and Cass? Although I, I know um, uh, that, that, that to a certain extent, as Cass oh, mentioned, we've mm -hmm. yeah, already definitely. kind of got into that yeah, with just, on the honest question. I, yeah, I did. I did talk about some because of the discourse of uh, of choice. Sometimes you are find you know those passing up you know to the opposite end of the binary more acceptable but definitely trans men and trans women's experiences are highly different especially if you are of a minority ethnicity then that's a whole different story in taiwan uh yeah the most most of us are han chinese you know ethnicity but we do have you know different uh indigenous tribes and we ha now we have you know immigrants we have you know so-called new immigrants are so people who got married, moved to Taiwan, and then uh, have babies. So I would say, first of all, you know, trans men and trans women, their experiences really are different. Sometimes people are uh, m most of the time less friendly to transgender women. They're more likely to be viewed as uh, potential sexual predators or just perverts. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and another thing is, really just how they look. Do they look good enough? Yeah, so I think that's a little bit cruel. Yeah, and then because of the, the celebrity culture, some of the trans men and trans women, when they pass so successfully and they look, you know, so good, then that becomes some kind of norm for people. So if you don't look that good, it's actually harder for you to, you know, live as a transgender person. And, and that kind of touches on the celebrities. Yes, Taiwan. I think there are several high profile celebrities that are extremely vocal of their support of uh, Tongzi community, like uh, Zhou Lintai and Amei. Uh, two of them are the super diva in, uh, in, in Taiwan. I think even for younger generation, they still you know, really, really like these two. So I think their influences are definitely there. But, you know, as a discourse scholar, you know, sometimes we need to pay very close attention to what kind of message, what kind of discourses are they shaping, right? When, when they came out, I think in 2016, all the A-liners, there was a huge concert, put a free concert called Love is Love. And they're all A-liners like Ame, like Jolene, and, all, and th all those people. And then they're like, okay, we need to support by same-sex marriage, but when they use the discourse of love, uh, I think there is a limitation to that discourse. And then again, that also kind of couch upon the discourse of choice, right? And then, and then that almost feels like, that also almost sounds like to some parents that if I cannot find a way to accept my child the way they want me to, I don't love my child, right? And then it actually became harmful to the parent-child parent relationship. Yeah, so I think it is very important that they are supportive, just that there has to be more voices to kind of balance out and for people to, you know, find discourses that work for them. Yeah, okay. definitely, Raza, uh, feel free to email me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Raza says she's gonna um, uh, email yeah, you um, uh, afterwards. Um, yeah. I mean, originally we were gonna, this was just gonna be a one and a half hour session, but I think we had so many questions. Yeah, I am, yeah that, thank you so, uh, thank you for allowing me more time. No, I think that, that, that's great. I think um, in a way it kind of felt like you were just really kind of touching the surface of your of your, uh, of your your project. So uh, I, I think we definitely need to try and find a way of getting you back here and ideally um, uh, in, um, in person in the, um, uh, in the future.
Yeah, um, I would love to. And, um, and lastly, of course, just to mention, uh, for those of you that are around in London, make sure to come in for tomorrow afternoon's uh, session starting at, I think at 12 o'clock, the first one on uh, Myanmar-Taiwan relations. And then we'll have a second one uh, starting at, um, uh, at 1.30. Uh, and if, if any of you are not on our mailing list, just make sure you um, get in touch with us and we'll make sure you're informed about all our um, uh, events. Um, but before we all go, would you like to turn on your uh, your cameras so we can get a kind of a uh, an online group um, uh, picture? And also, of course, we want to give uh, Rita a very big uh, SOAS round of applause. But thanks for sharing your your amazing research. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, listening to my talk. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So. Um, uh, could we get a few more cameras on and then uh, um, you could you get a, a picture for us? Are you sure? So is there anyone wanted wanted to join? Anyone else? Uh, anyone else going to join? i shy. <laughs> no worries. All right. Three, two, one. No. Oh, all right. OK, three, two, one. Great. Thank you. OK, Thank fantastic. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, feel free okay. to email me for more if you have any questions. We just want to get in touch. Fantastic. Fantastic. Good luck with the um, ongoing research and um, all the challenges for being a, a kind of a junior academic in such a, a tough time. Yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you. Hope to Thanks. see you all soon. Thank you. Uh, thank see you, you all uh, either Bye. online or in uh, in person. And I, I can see you, there's go. at least one person who's going to be um, at uh, a NASA in the audience as well. David, David, before you go, just okay. two minutes. One okay. is uh, about the documentary. What What do you think of that one? Acha Yilan. Um, the, the indigenous.